In this final video, we'll look at an assortment of tips and tricks that are useful for training deep neural networks. We've seen the basic principles of building a neural network, but to train large neural networks and to train them well takes a lot of different uh, techniques, and we'll go through most of them in this video. We'll look primarily at initialization and normalization, regularization, and then at several other tricks. Initialization is the uh, method by which we choose the initial values of the weights before we start training the neural network. And this is important because if the gradients are zero for this first batch, then training will never start. And if the uh, training never starts, then the network weights never change and we never learn anything. And if the weights are not quite, if the gradients are not quite zero, but relatively near zero, then training starts very slowly and it takes a long time to get anywhere. On the other hand, if the gradients blow up, then we get not a number of values and uh, our program crashes or uh, never learns anything. So what we're looking for when we choose the initial weights is a, a set of random values for which the gradients are kept consistent throughout the network, not too big and not too small. Uh, from start to finish at the first batch. And after that, learning starts and learning takes control of the, of the values of the weights. So it's mostly uh, for that first batch that that initialization is important. To see how things might go wrong with initialization, imagine that we have a neural network like this with uh, four weights and only one hidden node. <clears throat> if we set these uh, hidden nodes to have linear activations and we feed it a, a value of, let's say, one, then if, the, then if the weights are larger than 1, we see that the value steadily increases as we move up the network. If the weights are smaller than 1, we see that the value steadily decreases. And both of these are undesirable properties. We want the output value not to go to 0, because then the activation dies out before it reaches the end of the network, and we don't want it to blow up either because then as we go deeper, we are uh, more and more likely to see exploding activations, very high values that are likely to result in infinity and not a number. Of course, if we, as we've uh, drawn here, use sigmoid activations, that problem is partly solved because these sigmoid activations reset all the values to one automatically. The problem with the sigmoid is its derivative. If we look at the uh, function of the sigmoid, we can see that its derivative is at most 0 0.25. And everywhere else, the derivative is smaller. This means that as the derivative travels back down the network, every time it hits a sigmoid unit, it gets multiplied by 0 0.25. And for a deep network, that means the gradient values die out very quickly, unless we set the scale the weights to boost them again, which is a difficult balancing, tr balancing trick. And this is one of the reasons why the ReLU is uh, probably so much more popular because the ReLU has only two possible derivatives. The derivative is either 1, which keeps the activation values precisely as they were before the activation, or it's 0, in which case the activations are killed together with the gradient. Now, obviously, that's something to be careful about. We want, for every forward and backward pass, at least some of the neurons to be on the right side of this, uh, of this drawing to uh, get through the ReLU and to get a gradient back. But once we've solved uh, that problem, and we can solve that by proper initialization and by proper normalization, we know that the activation function is not responsible for uh, killing the gradients of the network. So what is the principle of a good initialization? The main idea is first that we make sure that our input data is normalized. So we rescale our input data so that the mean is zero, that the covariance is equal to the identity matrix. And this isn't very strict, this is usually the best, especially if you have early ReLU activations, but something like a uniform distribution over 0, 1 is usually fine as well. Uh, the main thing is that our input values need to lie within a definite range, and that range needs to be not too far away from the origin. What we uh, can then do, once we've normalized our input data, is initialize our layer weights so that they have the property that if the input has mean 0 and covariance i, then the output does as well. And we work it out so that the same holds for the backward function. And if we do this, then we know that no matter how many layers we stack together, 
the activations will always stay consistent. They will never blow up and they will never vanish. And the same holds for the backward. We'll look at two forms of initialization, Gloreau initialization and Hay initialization, uh, respectively also known as Xavier initialization and Kaiming initialization. But first, let's look, let's look at this normalization. How is that done? For one feature, uh, it looks like this. We compute the mean and we divide by the standard deviation. Uh, and that rescales our data to uh, essentially look like it's standard normally distributed. And if we do this for every feature separately, then we end up with this property that we have a zero mean and a uh, identity covariance uh, matrix. So let's look at this Gloreau initialization. We will make the assumption that we're dealing with a linear layer at first. So we have an input vector x, which is multiplied by a weight matrix w, which results in y. And for the backward function, the gradient 4y is multiplied by the transpose of w, which gives us the gradient 4x. Now, to choose the initialization of w, we will make the following assumptions. First, we assume uh, that the um, mean of x is 0 and that its variance is 1 along every dimension without covariance. So we assume that the uh, x, if it's the input, is correctly normalized, or if it's a hidden layer, that all the layers below it are properly initialized already. We will choose the weights, the values of uh, w, in such a way that their expectation is zero and that their variance is equal to a constant value that we're going to work out now. And what we require is that after this multiplication, the variance of y is also one. So we start by writing down the variance of one element of y. This is equal to the dot product of one of the rows of w with x. And the variance is a linear function, so we can work it into the sum. Now we cannot just decompose normally the variance of the product of two random variables, but in this case we know that these random variables are chosen independently. We do not, when we choose the w, take into, the, into account the value of x. So we can actually decompose it like this, and these gray parts will just be uh, constants, because we know that uh, the expectation for wik is zero, and we know that the expectation for, w, for xk is also zero. So we are just left with the decomposition of the variance of wik times xk is the variance of wik times the variance of xk. And the variance of uh, wik is always c, and the variance of xk is always 1. So this whole sum works out as m times c. So to satisfy the first constraint, we need to set the variance of wij equal to 1 over n. And to satisfy the second constraint, we need to set the variance of wij equal to 1 over m. We can't do both, so we set the variance equal to 1 over the average between n and m as a kind of uh, middle ground between the two constraints. And hopefully that'll get us close enough to a variance of 1 to give uh, good training and no vanishing gradients. There's a couple of ways to uh, sample from a distribution with this kind of variance. The standard Gloreau initialization uses a uniform distribution with these bounds, and if you work out what the variance of these bounds are, is, then you get the required value. But you can also use a, a normal distribution with this standard deviation, and then you also get the required variance over your wij values. Hay initialization is a slight tweak on Gloreau initialization that takes into account the activation that comes after the linear layer. And for the example of the ReLU activation, we know that if we apply a ReLU activation and the output of the linear layer before the activation is standard normally distributed, then we will lose about half of our activations. Half, about half of them will be negative and about half of them will be positive. So about half of them will be canceled out by the ReLU activation, which means that our variance halves. So in order to compensate for that, we need to double the variance and quadruple the standard deviation, which looks like this. Now, with proper initialization like this, you should be able to train without much trouble networks that are pretty deep. But after a while, even with this kind of initialization, things start to move about and uh, shift in the wrong direction purely by chance. And if we want to combat that to go even deeper for our neural networks, what we can do is we can introduce batch normalization layers. And a batch normalization layer is a layer that simply looks at its input, which is a batch of instances, and rescales them to satisfy this constraint, that the output should have mean zero and covariance 
uh, equal to the identity matrix. And the way it does that is pretty simple. A batch of values goes in, it computes the mean and it computes the variance over that batch, and then it applies a very simple normalization operation, subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation, adding a little epsilon to the standard deviation for numerical stability. At that point, x hat is normalized. It has zero mean and identity covariance. And we can then apply some learnable parameter vectors to put that standard normally distributed batch anywhere we want it to be in space. So we get the best of both worlds. We get an output that can be anywhere it wants to be, but we also get gradients that don't vanish because it, at every step of the way here, the gradients are well behaved. Now, one problem that we need to deal with is that if we apply batch normalization in this way during test time, we're actually in danger of test set leakage. Because during inference, we should only look at one instance at a time. It's not realistic to look to get a batch of instances and then to look at the properties of that entire batch. It's more realistic for our model to get one instance at a time and to have to predict the uh, target value for only that instance. Essentially, using batch information is looking forward in the test data, at data that we shouldn't have access to. The solution is to either take a large batch from the uh, training set and use the mean and standard deviation from that, perhaps from the whole data, or to use an exponential moving average for the mean and standard deviation during training. But either way, we store somewhere a uh, constant estimate of the mean and standard deviation of the da training data as we see it, and we use that during test time. That does mean that your network needs to know if it's training or predicting, which for some uh, layers is a, is a requirement. We can take the same principle as batch normalization and apply it simply on the batch tensor in different directions. So for instance, in what we see here is a batch tensor of uh, a batch dimension n, a channel dimension c, and a height and width dimension that are shared in one dimension here in this picture. Uh, so we're actually looking at a four-dimensional tensor, but it's represented as a three tensor. And what we see is, for instance, uh, that instance normalization normalizes the values along the instance. So it takes, it normalizes the vector so that every image in this batch, uh, all the pixels have zero mean and unit uh, and identity covariance. The layer norm does so for a particular channel. Overall, batch normalization tends to work best, but it does require that you have a large enough batch to get accurate estimates for your mean and standard deviation, and it does require that your inst instances are independent and identically distributed. Another trick, if you uh, suffer from vanishing gradients or if your network is too deep to train, is to add a residual connection, which looks like this. We take the value x, we copy it in two ways, one of the values x goes into a block of layers, and the only constraint for this block of layers is that the input needs to have the same shape as the output. And then after the block of layers, we add the result back to the original x. So the original x is now the sum of the manipulated x and the original x. And this allows, again, the best of both worlds. It allows us to have a deep network with lots of layers, but it also, if those layers um, cause problems with vanishing gradients, it allows a non-vanished gradient to bypass that set, of, um, that set of blocks. So with proper initialization, normalization of the input data and occasional normalization halfway down the network, we can train very, very deep networks. Now, occasionally, we might find that they overfit. And to combat overfitting, we use regularization. And we'll use this definition as regularization it's basically a method that encodes a preference for a certain set of parameters over other parameters independent of the data. So before seeing the data, we can already say all else being equal, I will prefer this model over that model. And we've seen some forms of implicit regularization already. For instance, the implicit regularization that comes with the choice of optimizer, that comes with initialization and so on. But we can also add explicit regularization. And the most common way to do that is to add a penalty term to the loss. So we start with our base loss, which is here 
uh, called loss. And to regularize it, we add a penalty term, uh, which is multiplied by a hyperparameter lambda. And this lambda, uh, we can adjust to um, make the penalty term weigh more or less. But basically, this penalty term, whatever property we have in there, the higher that property for this particular model, the more it costs the network. The lower the loss needs to be for us to uh, consider that a viable uh, solution to our learning problem. And in this case, what we've used as a penalty term is the L2 norm of the parameter vector. And the L2 norm is just the Euclidean length of the vector in parameter space. So if we have a two-dimensional uh, model, let's say with a weight and a bias, then we can draw in two dimensions, we can draw our uh, model space, its vector from the origin to the, point in models, uh, to the point in parameter space that we're talking about looks like this, and the length of that vector is our L2 norm. So basically what we're saying is we prefer models that are closer to the origin. We can extend this principle to the LP norm. So we can take the Euclidean norm, which uh, is this square root of uh, these squares here, and we can extend that, we can generalize that to be the pth root of the uh, p powers of the parameters. It's called the LP norm, and it has uh, some interesting properties that we can make use of. So let's first look at what this L2 norm look like, looks like. We can draw an ISO line, a line of all the uh, models that get the same penalty under the L2 norm. So if we set P equal to 2, we get a circle, and these are all the models that get the same penalty under the L2 norm. And if we replace the L2 norm by an L1 norm, so we set P equal to 1, then these are all the models that get the same penalty. So we get a diamond shape. And if we decrease P even more, we get this kind of shape that is bulging more inward towards the origin. Now the interesting thing about the use of the L1 norm as a regularizer is that it's sparsity and forcing. That is, if we add this term as a regularizer, the um, gradient descent will prefer to go into the corners of these diamond shapes. It will, go, it will prefer solutions that are uh, exactly zero over solutions that are very slightly uh, that are that are very close to zero, and this gives us sparse solutions where a lot of the um, parameters in our solution will be exactly zero. And to see why that's the case, you can imagine normal gradient descent or gradient descent under an L2 norm as a marble rolling down to find the bottom of a round ball like this. If we now take this ball and replace it with a square ball, and we let the marble roll down that, uh, we find that it still ends up in the bottom. But if we tilt the ball slightly, which is sort of the effect of the regularizer, we see that the marble is very likely to end up along the edges of the ball rather than at the flat parts. And that's essentially the edges is essentially uh, the points on the axis. So we're pushing the model towards the uh, points that are on the axis of our parameter space. Here's what that looks like. If we have a loss surface that looks like this without any regularization, then if we add L2 regularization, we see that the white parts of the, the uh, area of good solutions is pulled inwards towards the origin. And if we add L1 regularization, we can see the sharp edges along the axis where the model wants to, uh, wants to end up. In practice, we often do L2 to regularization with the squared norm rather than with the norm, which works out as the dot product of W with itself. Um, this is mostly done for historical reasons, computational simplicity, and ease of analysis. And we'll see an example of that now in the analysis of weight decay. And weight decay is a very different kind of regularization on the face of it, which looks like this. We perform our gradient update, in this case with plain stochastic gradient descent. And after that, we add another step where we multiply w by a value which is slightly smaller than 1. So after every gradient update, we simply pull the gradients back a little bit towards 0. 
So intuitively, this is doing the same sort of thing as the L2 regularizer. It's pulling the solutions back into the origin and saying, I prefer solutions that are close to the origin. What we can do is we can look at the weight update for a loss that is L2 regularized. And here we use the square of the norm that looks like this. We simply fill in the value of the gradient, which consists of the main loss function and this penalty term that we've added. We can then work the nabla into the brackets and into this penalty term to see what the derivative of this penalty term is. And if we work this out, we get this for the value of the penalty term. If we fill this back into the gradient update, we, get, we can separate out these two terms into two separate steps. So if we first subtract the gradient for the loss and then the gradient for the penalty term, we see that the penalty term actually rewrites into the same form as weight decay. We just have to change the value of lambda so that it matches the desired value of gamma. And for this reason, for a long time, weight decay and L2 regularization were thought of as equals and were uh, used interchangeably. And practically, this was usually implemented as shown on the left because that's a lot, that's a lot cheaper to implement. If we implement the version on the right naively, we're adding nodes to our computation graph and we're getting an extra gradient for every single parameter, whereas the version on the left uh, doesn't require using the computation graph and is a simple in-place operation on the parameters. The problem is that as we moved away from plain gradient descent using other optimizers, this derivation doesn't work anymore. So if we switch to Adam, there is a fundamental difference between doing weight decay as we do it on the left and L2 regularization as we do it on the right. And this problem persisted for so long that by the time it was finally finished, the solution needed to be introduced as a new version of Adam called Adam W because the original implementation of weight decay for Adam was already legacy code. So if you are using weight decay, uh, and you want to use it properly with Adam, make sure to use Adam W. There's an interesting relation between penalty terms and priors, which is worth looking into. So in a lot of cases we've uh, seen already, and we'll see a lot more of this, our optimization problem is actually a probabilistic one. And the value we want to maximize is the maximum a posteriori criterion, which consists of our probability distribution, which is parameterized by the parameters that we want to find the value for, we want to maximize the probability of our data, but we want to multiply that by a prior on the parameters. Now, if we do this in a deep learning setting, then PW of X is essentially a neural network, and PW is a probability distribution that we place on the, the parameters of that neural network. And the first thing we do in that case is to rewrite our objective function. First, we put a minus in front to make it an arg min so that we can uh, view the objective as a loss and we can minimize it because most deep learning systems are set up to minimize values. And the second thing we do is we take the logarithm of these probabilities because logarithms are easier to work with and give us nicer gradients. So if we work the logarithm into the multiplication, we separate these two out, then we see that we're actually minimizing Again, a base loss, which is the loss of our neural network. This might be a softmax loss or something like that. And we are augmenting that by a penalty term, which gives us a, a preference over certain parameters for certain parameters over others. And if this sounds like a stretch, we can have a look at what happens if we use a normal distribution, a standard normal distribution, as our prior on the parameters. So then our penalty term becomes the negative log of the uh, density under the normal distribution, the density of W under this uh, standard normal distribution, we can fill in this whole complicated function that gives us this density, and we see that by applying this logarithm, and by getting rid of any terms that don't alter the minimum, uh, we are left with only this as our penalty term. Everything else we can get rid of because we're only looking for the um, arc min, and this is essentially the L2 loss. So here we see that putting a normal distribution as a prior on the weights of our network is equivalent to using an L2 regularizer. Except, of course, that here we don't have a penalty weight. So how can we interpret this weight that we add to the penalty term? Well, one way to do that is to uh, modify our prior. So we start with our original prior, we raise its density or its probability to the power of alpha, 
we need to renormalize them because we, uh, by doing this, uh, pw to the power of alpha may no longer sum to 1, so we divide by the uh, integral over uh, all values v to make it sum to 1 again. We call that new distribution p alpha. And then if we work out what the uh, loss function is, the log loss is, we see that this um, renormalization term disappears because it's a constant, and this alpha that we've raised to the power of can be taken out of the logarithm and uh, becomes our penalty weight. And if you look at a function raised to a power of alpha, what you see happen is that the bigger alpha is, the more it increases the contrast between the peaks and the low values of the function. And the smaller alpha is, the more it decreases that contrast. So essentially what alpha does here, it tells us how much we believe our prior. It gives us a way to tune the strength of our prior probability. A completely different way of regularizing is dropout. It's a very simple principle. We simply, with a certain probability, disable connections in our neural network. So for every forward run during training, with a certain probability, a number of uh, uh, every connection is dropped out with a certain probability. And by dropped out, we mean that it's multiplied by zero or in, in some other way. It doesn't take part in the forward pass. And what this forces the network to do is to not rely on one single neuron to solve a problem. It basically forces the network to learn to solve every problem in different ways. And that stops it from overfitting, because overfitting is very likely to rely on these specialized subnetworks. The one thing that you have to remember when you apply dropout is that when you turn it off at test time, the activations are going to rise a lot because uh, all these dropped out neurons that you saw during training are, will no longer be there. So you need to adjust for that by reducing the activation by a factor of p. And here's a very pithy description of what dropout does. If you learn how to do a task while you're drunk, you should be able to do it even better when you're sober. Finally, we'll finish up with some tricks that can often help in a deep learning setting, especially if you don't have a lot of compute or a lot of data at your disposal. The first is data augmentation. This is simply the practice of taking your input and applying some simple random manipulations. This is very common in image tasks, where essentially we see that if we slightly rotate our image or if we slightly shift our image to the left or right, or if we add some very light noise to our image, it shouldn't affect its label. And this has two benefits. One is that it forces your network to learn certain invariances. So we saw in the previous lecture that a convolutional neural network has a natural translation invariance, but it doesn't have a natural rotation invariance. So to teach it to be rotation invariant, we can simply, for every image we have, show it lots of rotations of that image with the same label. And then simply through its weights, it should eventually learn this kind of rotation invariance. The second is that it reduces overfitting, because if you have enough random manipulations, you can be sure that you never see this exact same input twice. The only thing you need to be careful about is to choose your invariances and your, therefore your transformations carefully because, because introducing some invariances, some augmentations can harm your performance. And on the right we see an example here in the MNIST data. If we have an image like this with the label 9, then it's actually harmful to rotate it 180 degrees and give it the label 9 again because the rotated version with 180 degrees should be recognized as the digit 6 instead. So you cannot just apply data augmentation without thinking about it. You do have to look at your data and think about what kind of augmentations are right for this kind of data. And the final trick we want to talk about very briefly is transfer learning. And transfer learning is basically the principle that if we train a very large model on a lot of data, then quite often it's true that these uh, the first bunch of layers of this model extract features that are not just good for the task it's trained on, but that work well in other domains as well. So the basic principle here is that somebody trains a large model to classify, for instance, ImageNet or predict tokens in the large natural language corpus. 
Examples of this are the Inception Net, the ResNet, VGT, MobileNet, GPT-2 or BERT. All of these models can be freely downloaded. We remove the last layer so that the model doesn't do what it was trained to do anymore. And we stick on top of it a new classification layer and we train only that layer to do what we want it to do. So what we get, because only the last layer requires the gradients, our computation graph is actually very small. Our computation graph is only this last layer. So we get state-of-the-art performance at the cost of a linear model. This principle of transfer learning, basically inserting a pre-trained network and building on top of this, is very popular uh, in many uh, areas of uh, deep learning. And it's something that you can easily do with very limited hardware. So for students' projects, this is always a very good uh, direction to explore. That brings us to the end of the lecture. So let's briefly recap what we've talked about. We've looked at the basic process of training a deep learning model, designing, implementing, debugging, tuning, and publishing. We've looked at the deeper question of why any of this works at all. Uh, we didn't quite answer it, but we did get some hints from randomization experiments, from double descent, and from the lottery ticket hypothesis. We've looked at optimizers like Newton's method, momentum, and Adam. And we've looked at our toolbox, which contains many different tricks for initialization, normalization, and regularization. Next lecture, we're going to be looking at recurrent neural networks and mod methods for training uh, on sequential data. But for now, thank you for your attention and feel free to email if you have any questions.